Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. I'm so excited to have been introduced to this woman. We just have met now though, we spoke a little bit on the phone. Her name is Jules Park Robinson. Uh, she's got loads of history in the British Army. She's also, total mouthful, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, the chair of the board of directors for the British Wheelchair Basketball Correct, yeah. Association <laughs> team something. Um, basically an amazing woman who's done amazing things. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Petra. It's great to have you. So we love to start with a little bit of a warm-up question, just to see what you've learned in your life before we dive into the deep end. Um, and our question for you is, what do you reckon has been the best piece of advice that you've ever received about work or your career? Any bits of advice or role models or someone who's influenced you alongside your career? Do you know what? That's probably my dad. Um, and it stems from being a child and being at school. And then it continues even now as I've kind of transitioned from a military career into a civilian one, where no matter what the situation was, if you're presented with a bit of information, it was always read the question. And he's so right, because actually sometimes people can ask you something and you hear some, you hear one thing and you interpret it one way, but actually the reality is that the information they wanted was something completely different. So it's, and I suppose that translates into just a broader idea of listening full stop, you know, we've got two ears, one mouth. People say that a lot, but that's so true. Listen to other people. And it's actually really hard to do, even like the theory is so like, just listen. But we put, we come with all of our baggage and conditioning, don't we, that we put on to what someone says. Yeah. And I think also having a military background, you're, you're used to being trained into coming up with solutions and, you know, troubleshooting, fixing everything. And so you want to, you know, having, to having that confidence to create that space for people to actually then just express what it is that they're trying to say without jumping in and offering them, you know, a, a solution is really, really difficult. Something that I have to work out. It's so hard, especially for leaders. We do a mental health for leaders uh, a sort of course. And one of the activities is that act of listening. And it's a really simple, for five minutes, you're going to listen to someone else, five minutes only. And you're not allowed to advise, fix, or tell them, you know, you know exactly how they feel. This is exactly what they should do. And it's incredible how difficult it is for some people. They're like, the longest five minutes of my life. I can't tell them what to do. Um, I want to pick your brain just uh, around this in a minute. But before I do, secondary question, was there anything that you had to unlearn in order to be effective in your work? Anything you had to unlearn uh, in order to be effective at work? Um, so I think that for me, um, I like to control things. You have to be able to let go a little bit to be an effective leader, and particularly in the military. And my husband will always say to me, delegate, then delegate again, and then delegate to the point of being really uncomfortable, because that's when you shine as the leader, but the people that you work with are empowered and able to, you know, bring their best selves to work as well. So I find it difficult, but I have had to, I have had to learn to or unlearn that actually, you know, if you know what you're doing, you want to you want to deliver it to the best they possibly can don't you so the the inclination to get stuck in I mean, even this morning I was with my mum and she's like oh, I want you to make you a nice breakfast before you get on the road and I wanted to do it and I was like mum you're in your 70s and you're still a feeder <laughs> it's like, I can cook my own breakfast but actually but having that ability to then let go and 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 it might not be the way that you do it but actually it allows people to to learn doesn't it I'm excited about this conversation because I'm in the middle of that, having been an independent consultant for a number of years and now scaling and having a team, this idea of delegating and letting go. Well, that's get hard. It. Oh, it's so hard because I've been the expert in my field for a considerable number of years and now I'm teaching people, but equally they've got to test it. It's probably the hardest thing out there um, to know what the balance is because surely mm. there are some times, and you're talking about from a military perspective where you've got to obey orders and I don't know if that's old school or if that's um still no, that's so true. Yeah. right where whereas a leader you do have to take control yes so, like how yeah. do you know the tipping point yeah and actually having an environment where you're allowed to fail and therefore learn that's really difficult and you know and the military has really come a long way in trying to create that environment for people and saying you know this is an environment where it's safe to fail 
do you actually feel that as a person and actually do you feel that as a woman and that will be a really interesting thing for us to explore a bit later on because well, i imagine it's a bit of a man's world going down the the military route so so in your own words give us just a little bit of a flavor of what your career has has been like so I think um, from quite an early age, I was really keen to have a job that was kind of outdoors rather than sat behind a desk, although in my latter years, that's what I ended up doing. And so um, we went along to a careers fair for my elder sister, um, saw a, a, a stand with all three you know, armed forces at the time uh, and uh, met this, this military uh, female captain who you know, talked about going skiing and doing all these exciting things. And I decided I wanted a bit of that. So I decided age 15 that that's what I wanted to do. So um, joined the army straight after university and spent 20 years in the military police. Um, lots of sort of service uh, across the world, but, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, six years in Germany, um, Kosovo. So you know, lots of varied experiences. And really sort of the pinnacle of my career was um, commanding my own regiment. Uh, so the Special Investigation Branch Regiment, so 320 personnel responsible for the investigation of major crime and serious incidents ac across the world. Um, you know, real huge uh, privilege for me. Um, and then I really came to the conclusion that uh, that was great and it was really exciting and I had a fantastic time, but I was in my early 40s and what was next? And I just decided that there was a big wide world out there that I hadn't had the opportunity to explore and um, and that I wanted to, to go and, and try something different. Um, but a problem, I suppose, for me, and again, we'll talk about this later on, but I didn't really know what that was. I just knew that I wanted to have a change. Um, and so I, I left the army last year and uh, I went to work for a small business um, and I'm now working as a governance and compliance consultant uh, for a few months. Uh, um, but throughout that entire sort of career, sport has been something that's been hugely important to me. As a young girl, I was heavily um, sort of played into hockey, played hockey at you know, various different levels. And then when I went to university, I discovered rugby. I delayed going to, uh, to Sandhurst to join the army for 12 months because um, there was an opportunity to play in the Women's World Cup in 1998. So I, I did that, which was fantastic. Wow. Um, and then when I had children and could no longer play rugby, decided that I would learned taekwondo and korean kickboxing and lots of obstacle course racing so for me i always knew that career number two would have an element of sport in it um, and so when an opportunity came along to join the board of british wheelchair basketball I, you know i just grabbed it with both hands and, and now to be the chair and you know the lead into to tokyo and then planning for paris 2024 hugely exciting and really again privileged to be able to 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 help that journey Oh, I wish we had eight hours to do this conversation. Um, you sound super disciplined and driven or have been throughout throughout your career. I know you're you're kind of looking out and, and experiencing new opportunities now. Um, what drives you? Like, what is it that just pushes you to want to do the next thing and to, to challenge yourself in those ways? It's a really interesting question because I think there are many people who would say you're just a serial overachiever and that you're never satisfied and <laughs> what's the next thing? And I think I just want to be able to um, do the best that I can to add value where I can. And, you know, if someone said to you, you know, what's your legacy? I just want to feel like I've made a difference to people's lives. And that can sound really, really trite, but I do genuinely mean that, you know, if there's something that I can do or a profile that I can raise that will help even just one person, then it's a really positive thing to do. I love that. Just um, I'm, I'm driven in the same way of creating impact and um, supporting people. So let's jump into this topic uh, around mental health in the workplace. You have such rich experience with with teams, often uh, quite a male dominated environment, I believe. Um, we hear a lot about post-traumatic stress disorder, the suicide rate, a whole host of mental health challenges that can come in many workplaces, but the army being um, a key one. What have you witnessed? What has changed? What do you think is important about this topic? I think what's really pleasing is that the military is such a different place now than it was even when I joined 20 years ago. And, you know, let's not be around the bush. There was a huge stigma about mental health, that people didn't admit that they had a mental health issue. They didn't want to show any sign of weakness or vulnerability and therefore they would hide it. And I don't think we're in that place anymore. So I think for me, I've seen throughout my time some really 
different um, uh, you know experiences of, of how that can manifest itself so whether that be in an operational theater and you know people things that people have witnessed or you know the churn of an everyday role I think being a female leader it's quite different so I think that that has two sides to it I think as a female you're trying to desperately and I will use the word compete because that's how it feels. You're sure, trying sure. to compete in a, an environment where you are a minority. And there is a, there was always previously, um, you know, uh, almost an, an unwritten rule, I guess, that you would, you would succeed if you would conform and also that you would be, you're, you know, you're being judged against your male peers. So does that mean you have to act in a masculine way in order to be successful? And I've always really tried to rally against that because I think that you are a better leader if you bring your whole self to work. And uh, and I'm not a bloke, and uh, and I have a different way of a different style of leading, um, and that has to include demonstrating some vulnerability. And I think you know showing yourself as a leader to be human allows people to open up to you. And I found that really in my sort of last role, where um, you know the the things that the that individuals were experiencing, even on a day-to-day -day basis when they were conducting investigations, would be really quite unpleasant. And the impact on them as individuals and how they then took that, that stress and that pressure um, back to their family lives, you know, it was huge. And, you know, there were a number of um, problems that we encountered. And giving people permission to be vulnerable and to explain how things were you know, affecting, affecting them and supporting them and making sure that they didn't feel any less of an individual or, you know, that that was um, impacting on their performance at work and that someone was there and would understood and gave them the space and the freedom to heal. Um, it's really, really important. And, and I think that has changed over the last few years, definitely. And what do you think are the key differences that you've observed or experienced in female leadership and male leadership do you see a divide or is there crossover now i think there's much more crossover now and um, many you know some huge role models for me in terms of male leaders that i came across um, in my in my time in the army who were very supportive very human genuinely interested and i think the one thing that i would say that we're taught as leaders as you go through santos is about um you know you describe it as know your men because the majority of them are but actually it's about you know, who are you leading? Who are they as individuals? And we used to talk about the platoon commander's notebook. And, you know, for me, even being in, in for 20 years, after 20 years, being able to walk into the office and say, you know, good morning to whoever and, you know, how's your you know, wife or your child? But knowing what the name was and asking them, knowing about their life and knowing who they were as individuals, because collectively having that knowledge makes you so much more of a cohesive team and much more effective. Now, many leaders these days are seeing the importance of focusing on their people in that more in-depth way. I mean, they should have known it before, but it's more, more heightened uh, now. Um, what do you think is in, important for them to, to do or qualities for them to display as a leader to effectively support their people? I think it goes back to listening in the first place, yeah. giving people that space, permission and freedom to be able to talk and to be able to, uh, you know, acknowledge if they are, you know, having some, um, some struggles. Um, but then also putting in place some practical things which would allow people to have that space. Um, so for us, we we'd had a strategy where you know, see in the military, physical fitness is really important. And we all know the importance of diet and, 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 and movement uh, and a little bit of quiet space and how that helps your mental health. But actually building that into a daily routine so it becomes the norm and people are expected to do it as opposed to opting into that. Um, you know, the impact that we saw in terms of the instances of mental health issues, it was really quite radical over a 24 month period. Um, so, you know, giving people that um, opportunity to go outside, to have regular breaks, to have natural light, um, to make sure that, you know, there was a sense of community and there was somewhere for them to go to be able to 
uh, you know, talk or have quiet space. You know, all of those practical things are just so easy to actually implement that, um, you know, I would hope that leaders that in whatever environment were, were able to incorporate those into, into daily. Yeah, and I, I love you that you're coming at it from a prevention perspective. So you're saying if we normalize this in our routines, it doesn't become like a crisis uh, element. But many leaders these days um, are effectively working themselves to the bone. And the key complaint is, I don't have time. I am, I'm swamped. I've got to just keep moving forward. I don't have time to spend with each of my people to get to know them in that way. What do you say to that? I don't take that as an excuse, if I'm honest. And I think um, that's about you as an individual and having the confidence to say, because everybody is a leader, but everybody usually, unless you're a founder, CEO, has that next level up as well. So I think for me, I was quite clear about defining for my team what the priorities were. And if it didn't sit within one of those priorities, then why are you spending your time doing it? And that worked for me as well. So that when my boss would say to me, I need you to do X, Y, and Z, I could say, well, that doesn't fit into actually what my current priorities are. I can do that, but that means I'm not delivering on the following. Because you have to protect your people but you have to look after yourself first. I mean, that's a really easy thing to say. I'm not as good at it as I probably am coming across. It's the intention, right? And then the going a little bit good. like that, yeah. I know. But, um, and I suppose, you know, and my experience over lockdown is really interesting because I've been juggling, obviously, like many people, a number of different competing priorities. But you do realise that there are 24 hours in the day and, and I don't necessarily... Um, you know, take the view them. As someone says, there isn't, there isn't time. There's always time. It's priorities. It's how you choose to use that time. Absolutely. Now, I love the the vulnerability, the openness piece, and the allowing people to be their whole selves. I'm curious though. There's so, there's always some of those individuals who maybe want to hold back, who who maybe want to compartmentalize work versus home and separate them out in some way. Um, how can a leader support those people? Is it a one side? Like, is it like, hey, we've all got to share? Is it like, how do we do it? No, I think, you know, give people the option. Um, and so, and I think it's just being able to allow individuals to create their own boundaries. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And, you know, I worked with many people who wouldn't bring their personal life to work. Uh, and that's fine, as long as they're comfortable in their working environment and that their personal life isn't then impacting on that, you know, but actually, then just having the knowledge that the opportunity is there if they do have something that they want to share then that's great but it, you know we didn't all sit around on beanbags and you know share, sure, <laughs> share sure, stories sure. And exactly. sing, sing by and hug and stuff but i see what you're saying <laughs> yeah. it's like having options <laughs> so that different people extroverts introverts whatever at different stages know that they can have psychological safety i guess so Absolutely. that should they want to share they can yeah and i think for me you know when i saw so when i was at that that level you know I was the mum of two young children and I think I was always really open with my team about you know that mum's guilt so every time I had a female soldier that was was pregnant and um, you know I was able to share my experience with them and say you know don't expect this is going to be easy but you know these are the things that helped me and maybe there's something in there for you to go and think about if they didn't want to talk to me about it that's absolutely fine but it's about giving them that opportunity. You're giving them permission in a way. Um, now, you've been a leader of teams. You've also been in teams. So I'm thinking both the military, but also the sports background. What makes a, a, a powerful, productive team or, or a winning team, if you're thinking from a sports perspective? Trust has got to be the number one priority. So you've got to be able to trust in other people to, uh, you know, to deliver of their best. And that you know, if people make a mistake, it's an honest mistake. No one's done that intentionally. And I think in a sports team, that's hugely important. Having the confidence in each other's ability, but trusting that people are going to deliver, um, you know, of their best and that, you know, things go wrong. They always do on the pitch. They do. <laughs> and, uh, but no one's going to have done that deliberately. So, and I always felt, um, uh, you know, I, I captained the army women's rugby team for a number of years and I never felt that I was the best player when I was leading, I always felt that I was a better player when I wasn't. But at the same time, I preferred being the one that was able to create that that safe environment for people and to be able to share that. So I think, you know, um, it's just my natural inclination, I suppose. That's interesting. What what 
bit can shine uh, forward. Um, so, so trust, I mean, you were very uh, confident that that was the thing. That word came out quickly. Um, how can we build trust? You've mentioned a few things, I guess, taking time, listening, stories. Are there any other ways that support that building of trust so that people feel that they can fail and, and, and um, I guess, be supported? I think, you know, empowering people, that delegating bit we talked about at the beginning, you've got to give people, I know it's hard, but you've got to give people that, um, that opportunity to flourish. And then, um, you know, having that honest conversation about where they need support and perhaps where they don't. And it is a really challenging thing to do. But by empowering people and showing and demonstrating that you have confidence in their ability and also just knowing the individual you've got to know that individual in terms of what they're capable of and well and what they aren't because it's your responsibility as a leader to help them develop um, and but also understanding what their aspirations are because some people are really ambitious other people genuinely aren't and both sides of the coin are absolutely okay but actually there's no point as a leader pushing someone forward who doesn't actually have those you know those goals to, to to change or those goals to you know promote or whatever the opportunity might be it's about knowing what everybody wants from that situation and then nurturing that i love that so the more you know your people and you know what their values are the more you can match them or align them to the promotions the positions where they can be their best selves yeah. um i love it um so let's talk about you I mean, we've talked about your leadership wisdom and all your years of, of experience uh, with, within the Army and within those sorts of teams, but I'm curious about why the mental health topic is important to you. Why are you passionate about it? So, I mean, I would take myself back to 18 months ago when I decided, okay, um, I've had a fantastic career in the military. I've not fallen out of love with the Army. I'm still a reservist now. I still think I've got lots that I can deliver and add value, but I, I want to explore some other things. Um, and I think at the time, I was just so confident that um, there was a big wide world out there and I had a place in it and I knew where I was going and what I was going to do and I'd operated at this strategic level and I was going to walk straight into another environment and it was going to feel comfortable and I was going to fit and the reality was something completely different <laughs> and you know 12 months on from from actually sort of walking out of, of uniform um, I'm a very different person I think to where I was 12 months ago through this journey that I've been on and I think you spend 20 years where you wear a uniform and you wear a rank and the rank isn't necessarily about you know that I'm, I'm this important I've paid this much money or I've reached that that level it's the fact that you have an identity and people look at you and they look at your uniform and they look at your rank and they can instantly make a judgment about you that's not necessarily a positive thing but usually it is to say but you know where um, you stand as well absolutely I'm you say, so yeah. they can look at you and say okay so you've reached that level so therefore i know that the chances are you've had you've got this much knowledge you've got these skills and you've got that level of experience and therefore if I need something, I know what you can offer me and I know what you're capable of and I can empower you and I can trust you to deliver against certain things. And suddenly you come away from that uniform and it's like being completely naked because nobody knows that about me. And I was gobsmacked also to discover that lots of people actually weren't that interested they were interested in the fact that oh you've been in the army for 20 years that's fascinating you know tell me what's like going to afghanistan as a woman and a mum but they weren't actually interested in what my skills were and what i'd done and what i could deliver for them and i found that really really frustrating and i found that you know i thought that i was going to have this incredible opportunity and and i felt like i didn't fit and and after about a six month period, I felt like I totally lost my way and lost my confidence. And I was really great. I mean, I was offered a fantastic opportunity to work within a different organization. And it's allowed me to build that confidence back up and to really take that time to reflect and explore. So what, you know, what does really matter to me? What are my values? Why do I get up in the morning? What's my sense of purpose? And to rebuild and try and understand what the future might hold, because 
I kind of think I've got another whole career to go yet. I've done 20 years. I've got 20 more years of working life, probably more, depending on the mortgage. <laughs> we'll wait and see. And the world. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and so it was, it's brought me back full circle to going, do you know what there is? I've got something to offer. I just need to work out where that lands best. I mean, this resonates with me so much for, for different reasons. I was born and raised in a, in a cult and as much as being out of it and in the big wide world filled with opportunity was the most exciting and wonderful thing ever. I also lost my belonging, uh, my support networks, my understanding of where I stood, even if some of it was negative for me. So I really get that you're almost big fish in a smaller pond. Uh, and then suddenly you're just like, am I even a fish? Like, what's going on here? You're just out trying to go, where, where do I fit? What were the, some of those dark moments like for you? What were some of those dips? I think, um, you know, I've been in the military, which is, you know, largely, you know, a, a male population. So I'd always been in that sort of minority group. And whether we like it or not, that probably impacted on my behavior and the way that I presented myself in a working environment. And I then found myself parachuted into completely opposite, into a very female heavy environment. And I just found that um, I knew it was going to be different, but I didn't realize it was going to be so different. And I think, you know, those dark moments were days when I, though I never actually, my husband only said to me once, have you made a mistake? And, you know, have you, should you have resigned from the army? Should you have left? And I, and I genuinely don't think the answer is no. And his response to me was, it's only a mistake if you don't fix it. And I think um, I sort of threw myself into, um, actually mostly the British wheelchair basketball side and that my volunteering gave me that sense of fulfillment. I felt that I was doing something for the greater good. Um, I really felt valued by the people that I was working with and, and I felt like I could make a difference. Um, and that was really, I think, what pulled me out of the other side to say, okay, you can do this. And what's next because <laughs> there's always a what next for me um I you know some people would say you're never satisfied but actually it's more that there's always more to do it's always more to do so I know you uh you talk about inclusivity and that that's one thing you want your your kids to be really aware of and uh I want to highlight that you're working with the the wheelchair association the basketball association what's that like what do you see in in people with disabilities I guess about some of this and how it applies I think what's really interesting for our sport is that what people don't um necessarily um aren't aware of is that wheelchair basketball is played by both able-bodied and disabled individuals the chair is a great leveler okay. yeah so in international competition the rules are, are slightly different but in the on the domestic side um yeah both able-bodied and uh disabled uh, players participate um, so I think for me it's about you know how do we make sure that everyone has that opportunity to play um, my daughter was born profoundly deaf so for us as parents that was a hugely important thing to make sure that she had opportunity and access to anything that she wanted to do um, and you know to make sure that she had the same environment as her elder brother um, and and that she wasn't in a situation where she felt she couldn't do anything because of her disability. And we don't like to talk about it as a disability. We don't think it as a, she's a nine year old girl. It's, uh, it's a special superpower. Someone said to me, vulnerability is your superpower. But, you know, for her, it's the fact that she can lip read like a demon. <laughs> you have to be really careful what you say. <laughs> Have you faced um, uh, sort of stigma or challenges around that in trying to find the, the right environment for her? I think when she was very young, it was very difficult. Um, she was wearing hearing aids, she now has cochlear implants. And I think people were trying to be very kind um, and, you know, sympathetic. Um, but, uh, you know, you see a young child that's wearing glasses. You don't really, you don't necessarily feel sorry for them in that way. So why are you feeling sorry for my daughter? She's fine. She knows no different. She was born that way it's going to be more challenging as she goes through her teenage years and she's already started to see that element of, you know, well, why was I, why was I born deaf? Well, why am I different? You know, it's not fair. 
Um, and we try and turn that into a positive about, you know, this is your opportunity to, you know, to actually use this to your benefit. How are you going to use that to shape your future? Um, we obviously don't speak to her in quite those terms yet, but when she's a little bit older, then I think that's going to be really interesting to see what she, what she does with that. It was really difficult in terms of the, the lockdown and obviously we were at home for the majority of it and so she didn't really go out but you know my biggest fear was going back to school and you know people wearing masks um so she really i mean she can hear really well with her cochlear implants but when she gets tired um that's she, she relies a lot on lip reading and um i think people just don't necessarily consider the other challenges that people might have um, Absolutely, I'm I'm c completely deaf in one ear, so I know I can I can still hear, but I I don't often realize how much I look at people's lips uh, to keep, make sure I follow along until their people are masked up. And I have to go over and over again, sorry, excuse me. You know, I have to ask people over and over again, which makes me feel like, ooh, you know, so people don't realize what an impact that actually has on, on people with disabilities. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and I think many people can relate to the 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 question mark next to that career path. It's it's it, jobs are changing so so much at such a fast pace with technology, and um, you, the fact that you were in a career for twenty years is already saying something that many people don't get, which is we get this transition of two years, three years, five years, whatever it might be. It's often presented as a negative when you don't know exactly what your direction should be. It's like, people are like, oh, really? You must not be very focused, right? <laughs> I don't know. Do you think we need to reframe that whole thing around into opportunity or into transition time? I don't know. Absolutely. Somebody said to me about six months before I left the army, um, someone external said to me, um, you know, it's going to be really bumpy, right? And that's okay. And it's going to be uncertain. And you need to embrace that. And, you know, in my pig headed way, I didn't listen and thought, yeah, yeah, it'll be fine. Um, and that phrase just kept coming back to me over the last 12 months said, oh, this is OK. This this is the bumpy bit. And at some point I will have a better sense of direction and, and what that is. Um, and and I genuinely think, it, you know, I, I laugh about it and say, well, one day I'll know what I want to be when I grow up um kind of in my mid-40s now and maybe sure. I should know but actually I don't think that that's a bad thing I just think you know people can reinvent themselves on a you know a routine basis and I think that it's okay to acknowledge that you don't really know what where you should be um you know giving of your time and your energy because actually you know if you're you know you spend a lot of time at work don't you so you know it needs to be in something where you feel that you're you know really adding that value um so i think we should reframe it in that it's it's a positive thing we talk about growth mindset well if you're not um actually exploring what those opportunities are then how can you grow and develop an, as a person and i don't think that you know there is an age limit on that no, and I think there's something about exper experimenting. So you, you're testing different things out. You test it out like an all-female environment mostly and um, the, the British wheelchair basketball and a, a host of things. And all of that gives you information, doesn't it? Well, at this bit, I was my best self here. I wasn't here in order to... People, people kind of forget that it's okay to experiment with. Yeah, that's so true. And actually, you know, the last 12 months, so you know, that you know, veterans find it really difficult. And I think that we sometimes underplay how hard it is when you've been in that environment where you belong. You know what the culture is, you know what's expected of you, you've lived there, that's been your whole life. And then you're into a, a totally different environment where it can be anything you want it to be. But sometimes that too much choice. It's you overwhelming. Know, yeah, it is quite overwhelming. And so, you know, I don't think that necessarily, you know, we need to pigeonhole ourselves into that. And I think, you know, I have actually now, you know, been able to sit back and reflect and say, well, I know that there are some really positive things that I've taken from this last few months so that um, there are things that I've really liked about different environments that I've worked in. There are things that I didn't like, but I know what they are and that can help me shape what happens next. I know what I will tolerate and I know what I won't. Um, and that, you know, I think that's a really positive thing. So, you know, hopefully, you know, I will have come out of that bumpy, but there's still more bumpy to go, I'm sure. <laughs> well, and let's relate this to our global pandemic. 
right? Where many people, even if they had a, a perfect trajectory, my boyfriend, for example, had an events business and he, he's been doing well and it's been wiped out. So his perfect direction and fulfillment has been wiped out. So, so you, you, you resigned, but for some people, they, they've had less choice. So they're in their own version of a bumpy bit where they're like, yeah. shit, what do I wait it out? Maybe there's an opportunity that's different. What do you say to, to people who maybe are in an a, a enforced bumpy bit? Uh, and how can we reframe that, do you think? That's a really difficult question. It's because, tough, isn't it? You know, I, you know, so I've been so fortunate that I've had the opportunity to work throughout that period. Um, and I think, you know, it, it must just be soul destroying when you've, you've built a business and then it's just been, the rug's been pulled from under you. Um, my granny always used to say everything happens for a reason. She was a big believer in fate. And, and I bet that's, again, sounds probably like a really trite thing to say to people at the moment whose livelihoods are really on the line. But there are always things that you can do. You know, um, I would, you know, if I would to now find myself out of work, then there's always something there. It depends how you um, set that bar for yourself and how you think that might be perceived by other people. So I had an individual that I met who was a very senior in a corporate organization and who had been out of work for a couple of years. And when the pandemic hit, uh, she went to work for a supermarket and was doing the, you know, picking off shelves and for the online deliveries. And, um, you know, she said to me, Jules, you know, what I'm earning just about covers my own groceries for the week. But I have been so overwhelmed with the response from my friends and family in their pride for what I've chosen to do. And she couldn't comprehend it. But, you know, I think for me, it's that, um, you know, there will always be a future. It's how you build that and how you then start again. And gosh, it takes an awful lot of guts and an awful lot of energy. And it's exhausting to start again. Um, but there is a way through. You have to have faith and you have to believe it. And maybe you have to change direction and it will be bumpy, um, but have a goal and work hard. Even if the goal is simply to figure it out, right? Yeah. If you don't yeah. know what the outcome yeah. totally is. And the goal, you know, might be to put food on the table at the end of the week. And, you know, but actually that there's always a way that at the gut, like you say, you know, if the end goal is let's come on, coming up with a plan of how you're going to get there, <laughs> that then you've achieved success. Just keep showing up, and um, there's something about these are the times that you are you, we build resilience, right? It's the tough times where we build it, not just the good times. Um, what do you do? What are your tips for yourself for looking after your own mental health? And given that you're still in the slightly bumpy middle, so I found in the last twelve months that my health took a real dip um, when I was struggling a little bit. Um, so I ended up. Um, in a hospital for a few days and that was brought on by stress um and um a sporting my new sort of frankenstein scar here with having my thyroid taken out um so i had to really you know it's been i haven't been good i have not been a role model for my children over lockdown um in terms of looking after myself and that was a real wake-up call to say actually I need to do that not only for myself but to show them what we need to do um for me it's exercise it's going out there it's running um it's walking it's we've got a punch bag outside so I've nice. always done um physical sports and that was one thing I really struggled with when I uh, retired from rugby and why I went to do kickboxing <laughs> and so actually when you're having a bad day putting on the gloves and punching the bag is a great way to let off steam um so I think you know that is that is hugely important to me and also trying to eat well and doing what you know lockdown was really difficult for many people you know days blurred into one another and you know trying to create a bit more of that routine and sleeping more so I'm I'm, I'm definitely one for an early night uh, I tend to be a morning person so going to bed early and making sure that I 
get sleep. I live by my Fitbit and how many hours I've slept. And I get very excited when I hit a number which has 80 something on it. So if I've got seven and a half hours sleep, then it's a good day. Oh, we're definitely getting older when sleep <laughs> becomes such a beautiful priority. How old are your kids? They're 12 and nine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I love that how you associated the role modeling for our kids. And I think that relates to teams as well, that leading by example piece as far as looking after ourselves. Um, I want to think about, okay, many, many people, most people uh, are remote working, um, are there, there's no line between um, home life and work life. They're perhaps sitting at their desks more, so they're more sedentary. It's harder to have boundaries. Like, do you see, how do you see the new world of work moving forward? What do you envision? It's got to be um, more discipline in the way that we do things. I, I loved that when we first connected, uh, you know, your suggestion to me was, can we have a telephone call? I'm like, yes. <laughs> I said so I can walk can we be yeah. on the phone so I can walk <laughs> but you, you feel like you're always you know it's different isn't it when you're in the office you have that commuting boundary of how you get to work and then you come home so you have that decompression time naturally I think being ruthless about you know how you manage your diary and putting in those so I I will do really ridiculous things like I will put the washing basket at the other end of the garden so I have to like walk out to hang the washing at one end so that I just get more steps in <laughs> during the day but it's things like that and always just making sure that you have those breaks between meetings and forcing myself to have a lunch break so that I'm not sat at the desk sitting here like eating a sandwich trying to you know do emails at the same time and then physically closing the laptop at the end of the day that's really important to me and um, you know it's really easy to live in the same house as someone and then not actually converse but we make sure that we have dinner together and how was your day even though we've been in the same house <laughs> So probably routines, haven't seen each other and routines definitely um taking some ownership responsibility for what that looks like um any thoughts just on so you've you had so much of your your team experience managing teams all that stuff we were talking about at the beginning and i know you're in the the bumpy middle but in this new world of remote working and of teams perhaps not seeing each other what do you think leaders need to be thinking about or how can they be supporting their people effectively in this new world? I think it's making sure that you schedule time to talk to your team when you're not talking about work. So to have a, some kind of social check-in, that doesn't need to be a quiz or anything like that. It can be simply, this is a 20 minute period. We're not talking about work. We're just going to have a coffee as if you would have had a coffee if you were in the office together and making sure that you're scheduling those opportunities for people to actually just have a break but have a break with work colleagues so that it's not constantly work 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 and so you're trying to enforce those opportunities or also you know anything that you can do on the physical side so there's a couple of people who i work with who you know if we're going to have a call we'll have it and we'll both be walking um and actually you know oh you're going to do your three mile walk well I, i'll tell what i'll do the same and actually we're going to have a conversation and then you feel like you're being doubly productive because you're doing something that, you know, is actually, it's a, a work conversation, but you're getting something as a personal benefit as well. So I think as leaders, you need to really encourage people to do that. It's going to be really hard with the winter and the weather. Um, so I think, you know, making sure that people um, also have the flexibility to work around their own lives and their own schedules. So for me, I'm very output focused. Um, I've never been one to say to people, you need to work between the following hours. You know, I was about really, the result, the end result. Yeah, I was yeah. really lucky and I fought really hard to get a contract which allowed me that space so that I can work to to deadlines and I can work to to an output. But actually, if I need to do a board meeting for British Wheelchair Basketball, it's not then impacting on other things. And so that I don't need to sit there and feel guilty about that. So I can schedule my day around. And if I want to do something else, then I can schedule that in early or late around the kids or whatever it might be. We're, we're, flexibility yeah and that goes back to your trust thing around teams yes. if you're giving people flexibility there's the trust and the the clear expectations i guess around what those outputs are but within that treating people like adults so yes. that they can get on with their their side of things i do feel like because of technology notifications we are we we're, we've got this sort of pressure to be always on so this feeling real or imagined, but as soon as an email comes in, 
we've got to respond. We've got to get back to people. We've got to continue the cycle. How much do you think that is necessary? Because it's a competitive, you used that word earlier, uh, world where we've got to keep the hustle going if we want to have edge. And how much is it actually our own boundaries and communication that's actually more essential to practice here? I think it's a bit of both and it depends on your environment. I had a fabulous mentor who I had a similar scenario with someone else that I was working for a while ago. And she said to me, have you tested that theory that you think that you need to respond within 20 minutes? I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, leave it an hour and see what happens and then leave it two hours and see what happens. I, I tend to ring fence times in my diary. So I will put block out my diary for an hour and that will be my email time and give myself chunks of the day when I do stuff. Um, and so I think that there is, and I, you know, people replicate, don't they, their apps on their, on their phones. So, you know, you're on your phone with email and teams or whatever else, zoom, I've got it all on my phone. Um, but, but actually I turn the notifications off because I found that it was constant and you can't do it. You can't be your most productive. You can't be your most efficient and you're not leading by example if you're answering emails at 11 o'clock at night. Absolutely. What are the biggest parent to parent? What are the biggest hopes that you have for your kids? Uh, not necessarily what they're going to do, but what they're going to learn or who they're going to be in the world. I think um, for my children to truly believe that a diverse and inclusive world is going to be the way to go and that they are um, empowered to do whatever they want to do, that they have the freedom to choose, that they're not put into these stereotypes which say they should or shouldn't do different things, and that they have a world where maybe everybody's just a little bit kinder. I mean, we certainly need a little bit more kindness and empathy in the world that we're in. Uh, Jules, thank you so much for your time. I feel like uh, I got so much from this boundaries, letting go, exercise and food. Some of it's quite simple and straightforward, but we just seem to forget. Uh, and we wish you all the best on your journey you. through the messy middle into what I know is going to be the perfect fit. And we'll get you on the podcast again, because you'll be <laughs> like, I found the thing. And it's <laughs> wonderful. And I'm glad I held out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Petra. Thank you.